I don't know about you, but I could use a break from talking about the Pittsburgh Penguins from a team perspective because not a whole lot is changing. And there are only so many ways folks like Dan Kengerski, Matt Geica, and myself can say the same thing. As an aside, imagine how Mike Sullivan feels. Some of the challenges are within his control, but a lot of them are not. More on that another time. Today, what I want to do is I want to zero in on an individual and center our debrief around one of the more high-profile players on the Pittsburgh Penguins roster, a player who, aside from maybe Tristan Jari, has been the topic of a lot of discussion amongst media, fans, and I'm guessing management and coaches as well. The player is number 65, Eric Carlson. Look, the National Hockey League regular season is a marathon. It's the ultimate grind. As a former Stanley Cup champion once told me, He said, it's 82 plus games of mental warfare. It's a journey filled with highs and lows, as we have certainly seen with this year's Penguins team. It's for this reason that I, like most coaches, elect to break the season down into small segments, typically five games at a time. And that is exactly what I've done for this episode with Eric Carlson serving as the main focus. You all have opinions on Eric Carlson. You have expectations of him, as you should. He is, after all, the Pittsburgh Penguins' highest paid player. He's a three-time Norris Trophy winner. And he's Kyle Dubas' most significant acquisition to date. What I want to do for you here today is really what I strive to do both during and following every five-game segment of the season. I want to remove the emotion. And what I want to do is I want to utilize three things. The eyeballs, as in the evaluation, which I do through video. Statistics and analytics, some not a ton that I personally care about. And then there's stomach or gut feel, which our business will always be about. Today, you're going to get a little bit of all three as I walk us through Carlson and the Penguins' last five performances at the time we're recording this video. So three on the road against the Islanders, Canes, and Capitals. And then the last two, again, at the time we're filming this, at home against the Stars and the Red Wings. Eyeballs, analytics, and stomach gut feel from my perspective. What I'll do is deliver the information and I'll do a bit of coaching. And you, the audience, you can play the role of the GM uh, or the evaluator and decide how you feel about both my presentation and Carlson's play during the recent five-game stretch. This will be fun, I think. I'm going to pull on the big board, uh, and what we'll do now is we will start with the numbers. All right, so before we take a look at the information here on the board, heads up, today's episode might require a snack or a beverage. This one's going to take a bit. Remember, The debrief is here on the channel for the fans who really enjoy digging in and peeling back the layers. We're going to start doing that by pulling some information from the whiteboard. Now, this might be a bit challenging to see and follow. I get it. So what I've done is I've posted a link to a PDF that depicts all of this information on the board, most of which I'm going to walk us through here in this episode. I've posted it down below in the episode description uh, or or the box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, So if you want to follow along 
with a more clear, easier to read visual, check that link out. Again, it's in the episode description or, or the box below here on the YouTube channel. All right. What we have on the board here encompasses, I'd say around 80%, maybe 85 of the information that I care most about when I'm reviewing individual performance. We have opponent, of course, and we have score or result because the game itself provides tremendous context for obviously the rest of the information that we're going to look at. We have time on ice. We have goals, assists, and points because after all, we are in a results-oriented industry. We have shots. Attempts and blocks are good tidbits of information, but shots by itself, especially with a player like Carlson, is a very telling statistic. We have plus minus. Plus minus can be deceiving. Nonetheless, it's helpful information. And then we have scoring chances. Scoring chances is very much a subjective term. As I mentioned in a prior episode, my definition of a scoring chance might differ from Mike Sullivan's. It might differ from the analytics company that I pull a lot of information from. In short, my definition of a scoring chance is anything that poses a threat to the goaltender. And being a former goalie, I feel that I have at least some perspective when it comes to threats or challenges for the person manning the pipes. Here's the bottom line. In the last five games, including Carlson's very rough outing on the 7th of November against Carolina, as well as Monday's shellacking by the Dallas Stars, Carlson has been on the ice for 57 total scoring chances, 46 of which have come five on five, all right? Of the 57 total chances that Carlson has been on the ice for, 34 or 60% have been positive chances, as in chances for. 23 or 40% have been negative as in chances against. The number to hone in on is this number right here, 60%. 60% of the chances Eric Carlson has been involved in in the last five games have led to offense. That number drops slightly when you isolate just five-on-five five scenarios at 57%. Now, we have the column on the far right here. All right, D-I-S-C, right here. D-I-S-C stands for direct involvement scoring chances, meaning chances where Carlson played a significant role, in my opinion, in either a chance for or against. Examples would include a great pass in transition that led to offense, a blatant turnover or poor positioning that contributed to the opponent getting a chance. Just think significant role, direct involvement. That's what you need to know for this one here. All right. Carlson's direct involvement scoring chances. His number in this column in the last five games checks in. Here it is down here at 18 total, 11 of which have been positive or chances for. That's good enough for 61%. Keep that in mind. Here's what's interesting. All right. I love this stuff. Carlson took a lot of heat for being a minus three. Here it is right here in that Carolina game last week. Here's what's interesting about this. Three chances against minus three plus minus rating. He actually finished the night plus four overall, seven minus three in scoring chances, and plus two, five on five. Remember, this is supposed to be the unemotional part of the process. We've got to take all of this information in mind. Now, here's my question for you. When you look at this 
five game segment. Which game do you think was Carlson's best? Let's isolate three of them. Last Friday in Washington, a 4 2 win. Important to note because for many, winning is the ultimate stat. Carlson tallies one goal, one assist, two points, finishes. Uh, from a plus-minus perspective, even, and tallies seven shots on goal. He's on the ice for six chances for and six chances against. All right, let's go back to the first game uh, of the recent road trip uh, against the New York Islanders. That was the overtime loss. No points, three shots, plus two rating, on the ice for 10 scoring chances, seven of which came five on five. Hmm. What about the last game against the Red Wings to wrap up the five game segment? All right, this was the home overtime loss. No points, three shots. Take a look at this. On the ice for nine scoring chances for overall, six of which came five on five, and on the ice for only two against. By my account, 65 had direct involvement in three scoring chances for and didn't contribute to any against. There's eyeballs. There's analytics or stats. Again, some of which are subjective. Then there's stomach or gut feel. What do you think? What do you think when you see this information? If you feel inclined, leave your comments below here in the channel. What do you think was Eric Carlson's best performance in this five-game segment? I'd love to get a dialogue going amongst you, our audience, on this right here. All right, so my hope is that this information is either, it's either solidifying what you have felt in your stomach about Carlson when you watched these last five games, Or maybe this information is leading you to question a bit about how you felt. If it's the latter, welcome to coaching. If it's the former, welcome to coaching. Analytics, stomach, and now what we're going to do is we're going to tackle the eyeballs piece, as in the video. Oh, we're, we're not done here. In many ways, we're just getting started. Remember when I mentioned having a snack or a beverage handy? At the start of the episode, this might be a good time to pause and grab one or both. And just like that, the board has a whole other side to it. Here we go. All right, what did I see from Eric Carlson in the last five when I reviewed all of his shifts on video? And I watched all of them back. We're actually gonna look at some of them momentarily. As usual, We will rely on our favorite number here on the debrief, and that's the number three. That's the number three. Okay. Eric Carlson. I think you'd agree he's an offensive player. That's his MO. And for me, the positives in Eric Carlson's game, in the last five in particular, are linked to that. He creates and or as part of the offense in three ways above all. First, from the point in the offensive zone. There is no denying that Eric Carlson has very good vision and he has an eye for offense. For me, it's not about what Eric Carlson does with the puck. It's what he sees. He's one of the best in the National Hockey League at getting shots through from the point and executing what I call the shooter's maxim, that right there. It's something I use with my players. If you're a youth hockey coach watching today, pay attention to this. When a player has the puck, all right, the player is either doing one of three things with it. The player is either shooting to score because the goaltender is giving the player something, The player is either shooting for sticks, as in a stick around the net for a tip, or shooting for something else, as in a skate, a shin pad, or an intentional miss, for example. Carlson is the best defenseman in the black and gold at that right there. And he's one of the best in the NHL when it comes to generating offense from the point. 
Credit needs to be given here. He is deserving. All right. Second positive. Carlson generates offense for the Penguins through direct, firm, often plays to the middle in transition. Again, this gets back to that word right there written in caps, vision. And third point, Eric Carlson has the giddy up to not only start or join the attack, yes, but he's very savvy at popping into openings. Openings both off the rush and in the offensive zone. You'll recall Pittsburgh's first goal in their game against Washington last Friday night was a direct result of that, Carlson popping into an opening. So these are the areas that I see Eric Carlson positively impacting the game. Uh, These are his strengths when I look back on the last five. Now, going over here to this side of the board, in terms of analyzing the negatives, the weaknesses, uh, the improvement areas, if we want to word it nicely, the chances against. I'm actually going to start right down here with point number two, turnovers, because I hear this one a lot when it comes to frustrations with Carlson. The turnovers from my standpoint, gang, are not as bad as we might think. But yes, it's worthy of being on the board. Turnovers and puck mishaps have contributed to some of the negatives. Does he experience the occasional blunder and mishap with the puck? Yes, he does. But I want you to consider this. If you want a player on your team whose identity is centered around offense, to make plays with the puck. If you want that type of player, a guy who's known for playmaking, he needs attempts. And not every attempt is going to go right. If you want your child to pedal the bike on his or her own, they are going to fall down. Now, some of you are going to say that comparing a four or a five-year-old to uh, learning how to ride a bike with Eric Carlson, an $11.5 million player attempting plays. Some of you are going to say that's not a fair comparison, okay? But it's the principle that I want you to concentrate on. Players who make plays turn pucks over. This is tough for us as coaches to sometimes live with, but it's the reality. That's why I have the words fine line written over here and over there on the board. The question is, does the player make more positive plays than negative ones, and does the player or someone else on the ice finish the good ones and make them count? I need you to keep that in mind as we move forward. It has to be considered, all right? At the top of the list, we have position play or positioning, which I believe is the glaring weakness. I do think it's improving, but it's number one on the list for a reason. I don't see a lot of issues in the defensive zone with defensive zone coverage. I think that area of his game is okay. Where the issues happen is against the rush. It's through the neutral zone and into the D zone as the play is coming at him. At Marcus Pedersen, his partner, even at the Pittsburgh Penguins forwards. Most of Eric Carlson's struggles in the last five happened when defending the rush. It's still a bit of an awareness thing, yes, which we've talked a lot about here on the debrief, but it's more so these three subcategories right here. It's posture, being too upright and flat-footed at times. It's stick detail and stick placement. Carlson often has two hands on the stick when he should just have one. We're going to look at a few clips, and it's positioning on the ice as well. It's instead of being dots in, working from the inside out at times, he is dots walls, and then he's got to work from the outside back to the middle. No good. We've got a lot of video on this that we're going to look at here in a few moments, so stand by. And then we've got the third categories, way down here at the bottom of the board. I call it team or team dynamic. I'm going to leave it there for now. I'm going to keep my message on this one 
a bit brief and ambiguous on purpose. I'll circle back to that one perhaps at a later date. All right, uh, that's enough of staring at me and my face and all this text on the board. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at the video. The video is going to include a lot of the metrics from the other side of the board that we discussed previously, and then all the points from this side of the board that we just covered. We talk about how vision is one of Eric Carlson's greatest assets. That vision is often on display in transition. In this clip against the New York Islanders, the Islanders chip the puck off the glass out into the neutral zone. Carlson surrounds the puck and makes a great quick up to the middle of the rink. That's a quality read and a quality play. The Penguins enter the zone. What we see here is Sidney Crosby attempts to make a pass through one, two, and three layers of Islanders defenders to Marcus Pedersen on the weak side, and the Islanders get a breakaway. We see the visual of Eric Carlson hunting down this breakaway, and some of us assume it's on him. The reality is, while Eric Carlson is on the ice for this chance against, the play actually starts with a quality positive play by Eric Carlson. If we're going to pin this on anyone, we've got to pin it on Sidney Crosby passing through three layers of Islander players. Eric Carlson just happens to be on the ice here for this chance against. But I don't think it's fair to say that this is on him directly. When we were at the whiteboard, I used the term fine line. Players who make plays often turn pucks over. That's just how it works. Here's a clip from the Carolina game. The Penguins are down 1-0 in the first period. We know how this game ended up. Ricard Raquel gets the puck in the neutral zone, and he makes a quality play, bumps it back to Eric Carlson. Carlson attacks the blue line and turns it over. What Carlson is trying to do here, I think, is slip the puck through underneath the stick of the defenseman angling him, and it doesn't work out so well. What I think Carlson would like to do here if he could have a do-over is keep skating, use your speed, drive wide, and then at the last second, if you can't beat the defenseman wide, chip it off the boards to Ricard Raquel driving through. So turnover at the blue line, but watch what happens next. The Penguins get into good defensive posture, Marty Natchez for Carolina advances the puck to Gothaspear number four, and it ends up right back on Carlson's tape. And Carlson makes another great quick up to the middle of the rink. One touch by Malkin to Raquel, and the Penguins have a three-on-one. They get a nice scoring chance, which Carlson is on the ice for, but they don't score. If they score here, Carly gets a pat on the back, He's a plus, and the Penguins tie the game at one on the road early in the hockey game, and the overall vibe is different. Against Detroit in the second period, Carlson has the puck in the neutral zone. He scans the ice. He sees the white ice is in front. He takes that ice. He uses his legs. He advances the puck. He sees that the puck has been advanced cleanly, so he jumps in in. That is a good rule for defensemen to follow. If you make a good first pass, get up in the play. Raquel settles the puck down, uses his hands, punches it through. Carlson collects and makes a great feed in tight to Anthony Beauvillier, who gets the shot off. Unfortunately, Cop gets a stick on and it goes out of play. But you got to wonder, and I'm not pinning this on Beauvillier, this is good defense by the Red Wings, but if somehow Beauvillier gets this off a little bit more cleanly, maybe he scores. Maybe he gets it on net, there's a rebound in tight, we got a guy at the net, we got Sid coming through, Carlson may collapse, who knows, maybe the Penguins tie the game here. But you got to give credit. Good vision by Carlson in the neutral zone, way to be up on your toes, and then good vision again down here in the offensive zone. Unfortunately, the Penguins just don't finish. Again, we're looking at some of the positives in Eric Carlson's game. Overtime against Detroit. This is a grade A scoring chance for the Penguins. Raquel advances the puck to Carlson. 
Carlson drives wide and then he executes what's called an inside delay. When you delay but utilize inside ice, it looks like he's going to cross and drop with Evgeny Malkin. But instead, he holds on to the puck. He's got his eyes up. He makes a tremendous pass through three Red Wings players. And Evgeny Malkin does all but finish, not once, but twice. Gino is trying to score here. Give him credit. And more credit to Cam Talbot for two real good saves. But a hell of a read by Carlson. Now here's the thing, gang. If you want to hold Carlson accountable every time he turns the puck over and every time it doesn't go well, then you know what he's going to say to you? Well, why should I try to make this play here if you're going to yell at me if I turn it over? See, it's a fine line. If you're going to allow the guy to make plays, grade A plays like this that lead to grade A chances, you can't jump on him every time he turns the puck over. (laughs) Welcome to coaching. It's a stressful profession, and hockey's a fine friggin' line. Getting pucks through from the point is one of Eric Carlson's strengths. Second period against Washington, 2-2 tie. The Penguins were outplayed to say the least, by the Capitals in the second period in this game, if you recall. Evgeny Malkin gets the puck on the half wall, taps it to the point for Eric Carlson. We've got a wide-open player at the net here. Carlson, under pressure from the Washington winger going out to the point, scans, sees the opening, gets the puck through, and the Penguins once again do all but finish here. I think this is Raquel at the net. But this is great work by Carlson. He looks, he sees an opening, he gets the puck through. Ricard Raquel is all alone and does everything but finish. Is this a chance for, for Eric Carlson? Yes. If the Penguins can finish, and good save by the goaltender, they're up 3-2, Carlson's a plus, game takes on a different vibe. That's hockey. As we all know, Mike Sullivan loves his teams to play fast. And I know for a fact that he is a big believer that team success comes down to transitioning the puck quickly and effectively. Defensemen that play simple and direct are key to that. Eric Carlson goes back for the puck. He sprints. He looks. He sees. Now, he could bring this puck back here into all this white ice, but he is just simple and direct. He moves it up the wall. Give credit to his partner, Marcus Pedersen, for getting a piece of this Red Wing player. Play fast, play fast, play fast. The key to doing that is you've got to be connected and you've got to transition it quick, which Carlson does here. Great move by Raquel. Kicks it wide. We all know what happens here. Beautiful play to Marcus Pedersen on the weak side. Ricard Raquel is at the net. Penguins score what I call a next man goal. Anthony Beauvillier finally gets rewarded. But this starts with Eric Carlson directly being involved with a simple, direct North play in transition. Let's talk weaknesses now. Improvement areas, chances against from this past five game segment. All right, here's the Carolina game. Early in the tilt. And this this was not a great night for Eric Carlson from a plus-minus standpoint. Marcus Pedersen advances the puck. All right, this is the first goal against. It actually starts with a really bad turnover by Lars Eller, now a Washington Capital. Carlson sees that Eller cleanly and clearly has the puck here, so he anticipates getting up. That's the proper read. Lars Eller, just really bad turnover. So what does Carlson do? He cuts quick, which is good. Carolina advances the puck. Now, Carlson and Drew O'Connor need to be in great communication here about who has the Carolina forward. Stahl enters the zone, makes a great feed through Pedersen's stick. Carlson, O'Connor coming back. Right on the tape, tap, and it's in the net, and the pens are down one nothing. All right. Need a better play from Eller here. My goodness, that's not a good turnover. Need 
I think, a better sort from Carlson and O'Connor here. And what I want to see Carlson do is pivot with his butt to the net, have his stick out and face the action with his toe caps up ice. Eric Carlson doesn't like back skating. He doesn't like being backwards. But if he would just pivot right now, be in communication with O'Connor, have a good stick facing the middle, maybe this pass doesn't get through. And at the end of the day, you got to give credit to former Penguin Jordan Stahl. This is a heck of a play. The Carolina Hurricanes are up one nothing for a reason, and they're also one of the best teams in the league for a reason. We've got to give a bit of credit to them here as well. As we discussed at the board, a lot of Eric Carlson's minuses, actual plus minus and chances against, come versus the rush. This is Washington's second goal that tied the game in the second period last Friday night. It's another one of those goals where we see Carlson going back and some of us are tempted to pin it all on him. Let's watch the clip. Penguins win the draw. Carlson gets a shot through. Marcus Pedersen pinches as he should. Michael Bunting is now like the weak side D. Pedersen wins a battle, makes a nice little feed to Achari. He kind of loses an edge. Stick on puck by the Caps. Washington gets it, and they are off. My question is, why is Michael Bunting so deep? My guess is he's assuming, which is a dangerous thing to do, <laughs> I think he's assuming Achari gets the shot off, and maybe he arrives on time, Johnny on the spot on the backside. I'd like Bunting as the weak side D to be more up on the line. The Caps are off to the races. Now, I have three points to Eric Carlson here. Uh, I'm going to let it play out. You'll remember, Verona passes it across the ice, and the Caps tie the game. Three points for Eric Carlson. Number one, if you're going, go. That'd be my first point. If you're not, again, pivot, butt to the net, one hand on the stick, stick out and try to slow down the rush and buy time for Pedersen and Bunting to get back, sort out, and lock in their guy. I just, I hate how Eric Carlson is two hands on the stick here. I don't like that he's halfway in terms of kind of holding the middle, kind of pressuring. You got to make a decision here, EK. Go if you're going. If not, one hand on the stick, pivot, face the Capitals attackers and try to buy time for your teammates to get back in the play. And one hand on the stick here, two hands on the stick is playing small. I can't stand that. It's something Carlson and a few Penguins really have to work on. Another Eric Carlson clip versus the rush where positioning is the issue. Look, defensemen today are taught to angle and surf. That's the term that's used more than pivot and face the rush. But I still think there's a time and a place to do the latter, and this is one of them. Islanders bring the puck up. They fire it off the boards. Now, here's Carlson turned again. He thinks he's going back for a breakout. He thinks this puck is going to get deflected or tipped into the zone and he's going to be able to sprint back and go for it. The problem is the puck gets picked up on the wall here by Oliver Wallstrom. So what I want to see Carlson do is pivot right now. One hand on the stick. Pivot. Face the game. The game is up here. But he sort of drifts He's got two hands on the stick, and he's just wrong direction all the time. And he actually allows Wallstrom the ice to get the grade A chance, and Blomquist comes up with a really good save here. So again, Carlson, one hand on the stick, not two. You should only have two hands on your stick as a hockey player when you're in a battle. 
When you're in open ice, you should have one hand on your stick. You're in a better position to catch a bad pass if we have the puck. And you're in a better position if we don't have it to break up plays with one hand on the stick because you're bigger. He just When you have two here, like Carlson does, you give an attacker more white ice, more room, and more confidence. So there's a lot wrong here. Again, another situation where Carlson's on the ice for a big-time chance against with the play coming at him. I'm telling you, a great percentage of Eric Carlson's challenges happen versus the rush. This clip is further illustration of that. The Hurricanes go back for the puck. Notice where we are in the hockey game. 11 seconds left in the first period. Pens are down 2 nothing. They advance the puck indirect up the wall, and now they're coming up the rink. This is clear as day to me. Eric Carlson and Marcus Pedersen should just play the dots. If you give up anything, give up the outside. I like that he has one hand on the stick here with his stick extended. The challenge is Carlson slides, drifts ever slow slightly outside the dot. A great player like Svechnikov is going to see that. So he cuts inside, kicks it outside to Roslovic, and now Carlson's stuck. His feet are wide. His posture's off, he's lunging, he gets undressed and beat by Roslovic, and we come up with a huge save with two seconds left. This period could have ended much worse. I want to see Carlson just hold the dots here, give up the outside, and then when this happens right now, get back to the middle, even if you give up more wide ice. But don't lunge now, you just make a not great situation even worse. And this ends up being a chance against for the Penguins and a chance against for Eric Carlson in a game that definitely had its rough spots for number 65. This is Carolina's second goal. I got fired up watching this one. So the Penguins are in the offensive zone. Their triangle is tight. They reload. They have three forwards making an effort to get back, but they're deep nonetheless. Carlson's got to read this situation now. There he is. He's got to get off the blue line. He's got to cross his feet under a bit to at least get inside, and then he can control skate from there. He's got to have one hand on his stick, and he's got to be low. But he is instead outside the dots again, which is no good. Right now, he's got to read numbers. He's got to get off the line, and he's got to get into middle ice. But he's outside. He gets beat. Pedersen does an honest job to try to block the pass. Pucks in the net. This is a classic example. There is no more clear of a situation than this of why defensemen need to be dots in, one hand on the stick, big and long, on odd man rushes like this. All right, we're going to look at some positive clips of Carlson versus the Rush, mostly from later in the five-game segment, which tells me two things. Number one, he's being coached on these things. And number two, he does want to improve. So this is off a of face-off against Detroit in the second period. Red Wings win the draw. Unlike the last clip, Carlson reads the situation. And, and in this clip, he's even got forwards coming back. But he sees the Red Wings have the puck. Notice where he is about at or inside the dot, low to the ice, eyes up, one hand on the stick. Gives up the outside and then starts to close as his teammate gets back, Beauvillier hunting through the middle. And he actually forces the Red Wings to deposit the puck into the Penguins' end zone. Can't get any better than this. Opponent has the puck, they have speed, they have control, I am at or inside the dot, one hand on my stick, control skating, slowly starting to tighten and close the gap, and force a deposit. Nicely played by Carlson here. Posture, stick detail, and positioning versus the rush. Very quick, simple clip here. 6.23 left in the third period. 5-1 to one Carolina, yes I know, but this clip tells me that David Quinn was coaching Eric Carlson throughout this game. Here's why. Goalie breakout, transition, here's Carlson. 
One hand on the stick, low to the ice, protecting the middle. Stick on puck, pins his guy. Carolina still has it for the moment, but nothing against. That's the picture we need to see from every defenseman, especially Eric Carlson in that situation. There's no question Carlson improved his positioning versus the rush in the later stages of this five-game segment. You can decide if that's good enough or not overall. That's up to you. I'm just showing the clips because the video doesn't lie. Red Wings get out. Here's Carlson. Watch what he does. He gets off the line. Gets a little bit outside, but then quickly gets back inside. Remember that earlier clip we looked at against the Islanders where I was on Carlson because he was always turned and angling? Watch what he does here. Up, pivots, opens up, sees the man. That one little subtle pivot right there shows me growth and improvement. And of course, the Penguins have five back. And Carlson is good here in the defensive zone, comes up with it, bumps it to his partner on what's called an over pass to the other side of the zone to Marcus Carlson. But this just shows, this clip here, first period against Detroit, that positive corrections are being made. Let's go back to the Washington game, third game of our five-game segment. Penguins come up with the puck. Nice breakout play. Drew O'Connor has it. Here's Eric Carlson, weak side D thinking about getting up, thinking offense. Up, play breaks down. Watch Carlson. He stops right there, one hand on the stick, and gets back into middle ice. And he works from the inside out, which is exactly what great defensemen do. This is good angling detail from Carlson. Finishes his check. Stick on puck in the D zone. The Penguins don't get out. Carlson returns to the net front, tracks his man, like we've talked about on prior episodes of the debrief when the puck's at the point. We need to have three one-on-ones low, and we need to take sticks away. And Carlson gives a great effort here. And Blomquist covers the puck. All is well. But it starts with protecting the middle, and working from inside out. All right, final clip of the day, and I can think of no better clip to illustrate everything we've been talking about than this. This is the Penguins' second goal. They're in the offensive zone. Ricard Raquel rounds the net. Eric Carlson's popping into that same soft area he was in when he scored Pittsburgh's first goal, the hockey game. He doesn't get it here. Washington does. He returns again to middle ice, one hand on the stick, working from the inside out. Everything we've been talking about. Look at that. That's great stick on puck. Finishes his check. Bunting comes up with the puck. Eric Carlson sees. Bunting's coming up with it. He's out, and Carlson jumps up in the play. Hockey is not really a game of true positions today. It's a game of numbers. Maybe I can talk more about that on a later episode. Nonetheless, Carlson jumps up in that opening, gets the puck. There's that great vision, finds Michael Bunting, and Michael Bunting finishes. And the Pittsburgh Penguins go up two to nothing. This clip here is pretty much everything we've been talking about in today's episode. All right, everybody. So uh, relative to this segment, as in these five games that I chose for today's episode, you got the analytics. Your eyeballs have been more than tested through the many video clips that we looked at. What's your stomach telling you? you What's your gut feel? See, as coaches, uh, we sit down with our players after each five-game segment. We review the game stats, just like we did here today. We look at video, just like we did here today. We ask a lot of questions. We take feedback, and we absolutely coach, and we give our opinions. What are you telling Eric Carlson if you're Mike Sullivan? Let me know in the comments section down below. And as, as the general manager in this episode here today, you know, you're welcome to challenge me 
as the coach in today's episode, if you take issue with how any of this information was presented. I'm actually going to reserve my final opinions, my summary, and my conclusion for a later date. Maybe it's on another episode or, or perhaps during one of those great live chats with Dan Kondersky. I'm done for now. It's time for you to weigh in. I'm the coach. You're the GM. What do you think? Comment down below and like or subscribe if you would be so kind. That always helps us here on the National Hockey Now channel. As always, folks, whether it's uh, tonight against Columbus, tomorrow at home versus San Jose, or during the week ahead, enjoy Penguins hockey and enjoy our great sport because it is the absolute best. Thanks everybody for watching and we will see you next time.